Okay, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, at this nice conference. It would have been great to see everyone in uh, Brazil, uh, but I think this is a pretty good second best uh, option. Um, and, and, and I think I, I really appreciate and I'm sure everyone else appreciates the effort that they put into to organize this online uh, event. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, super string integrability and uh, how we can find it by using a certain version of Chern Simons theory. This is based on work uh, that Kevin and I uh, did a little while ago in some forthcoming work. So I realized when I was preparing this talk uh, that I had two challenges. One was the 25 minute challenge, uh, but the other challenge was that uh, I'm not sure that uh, the, the 4D Chern Simon story has been presented at IGST before. And so I'm going to try to give you a little lightning introduction into the work that Kevin and then Costello Witten and Yamazaki in a series of papers uh, have uh, developed over the past few years, just so you get a feeling for um, the kind of thing that then fits into the string theory description. So if we, uh, if we, um, what, what is 4D Chern Simons theory? Well, 4D Chern Simons theory is really a theory where you take a Chern Simons action in three dimensions. Um, and in order to integrate it over four dimensions, you have to uh, wedge it with some holomorphic one form. Um, and for us, Throughout the talk, the holomorphic one form will be proportional to dz, but it might have a prefactor in front of it, some function in front of it. So the reason you would do this is, and, and the reason I think uh, was that was Kevin's original motivation for this, was that um, if you consider such a theory, then the relationship that everyone always thought existed between the Young-Baxter equation and Chern-Simons theory um, gets really manifestly uh, material. So in the, in the old days when Witten uh, solved uh, uh, Chern-Simons theory in order to understand uh, the quantum invariance of knots, um, it was always felt that some of these Rademeister moves um, for the Wilson lines, they, they looked very much like the Young-Baxter equation. And I don't think it ever really worked perfectly. And in this setting, it really does work perfectly. So as a, as a physicist, you might say, well, this is quite a weird action, right? Um, you've got these two coordinates, w, w bar, and you've got two coordinates, z and z bar. And the way that the, the gauge connection appears, you see if you wedge uh, omega uh, with this action, immediately any term proportion in the gauge connection proportional to a z it disappears. So in this talk, you'll see that w and w bar are going to play the role of the string world sheet, and z is going to be uh, uh, the spectral parameter that all these integrable systems have. Okay, so let's see a little bit more detail. And I'm sorry that I'm so uh, sketchy here, but uh, I just want to give you a flavor of things. So let's look at the equations of motion of this theory when omega is just equal to dz. Well, in the WW bar plane, this is just your typical Chern-Simons uh, simplicity, right? There are no local degrees of freedom. You have a flat bundle on sigma, which is these WW bar coordinates. On the other hand, you have these uh, further equations uh, here, which involve the Z bar derivative, but they don't involve uh, the Z terms. And so these two equations just tell you how this flat bundle on sigma, how does it vary uh, when you move around the complex plane C? So this is one of these mixed topological holomorphic theories uh, that Kevin and others have, have enjoyed, have been studying for a while. Now, he, here's, here's the beauty. If you, if you accept that this is some slightly unusual gauge theory, um, here's the nice thing that you can do. So you can, it turns out, and, and Kevin showed this very explicitly using the BV quantization, that this is a perfectly well-defined quantum theory. And its, its, its um, observables are in fact open Wilson lines. So I don't have time to really tell you why open li Wilson lines, but these open Wilson lines have to lie in the WW bar plane and they're localized at points Z1, Z2, or Z3 in the uh, ZZ bar directions. 
So because the theory is topological, uh, you, you can move these lines around in the sigma plane. Right? It's topological, so it doesn't really matter where they're sitting. Now, there would be a restriction, however, if your theory was genuinely two-dimensional. You couldn't move this line, the middle line, through the intersection of the other two lines because that would change the topology of the diagram. But remember, we're in four dimensions. And in four dimensions, of course, these lines are sitting at different points in the, in the plane that I haven't drawn, in the Z plane. And since they're sitting at different points, they're not really crossing. And, and moving this line across, moving this Wilson line across, is perfectly OK, since uh, the, that doesn't change the topology. You know, you should think of these as little Mikado sticks. And you can move the Mikado sticks because they're sitting at different points in the Z plane. So in this way, you get, I mean, it's very brief, but you can do this much more rigorously, but you get the Young-Baxter equation. And, and that's quite a nice way of realizing uh, integrability using this 4D chain Simons setup. So one final thing, just to show you how these uh, quantum calculations go, just to convince you that these are really quantum gauge theories, is you can calculate the one loop, the, the, the one loop diagram uh, one, the lowest order interaction uh, between two Wilson lines. So this is some gluon propagator. I'm skipping all the details, of course, but when you do this computation, it's quite straightforward. You just figure out what the propagator is um, and you get this classical R matrix uh, for a homogeneous uh, spin chain, so a rational, a rational R matrix, classical R matrix. And then there are these uh, you know, powerful mathematical theorems that say that once you have one of these uh, rational R matrices, uh, sorry, one of these classical R matrices, then there's a unique uh, exact answer that this lifts to. So that's you know, a very physical way of, of arriving at an integrable system. Okay, so the story doesn't end there. Uh, and uh, Kevin and Masahito wrote this, one a very nice paper in which they said, well, why don't we consider omega to have to not just be dz, but to have poles and zeros in some way that I'm going to describe in more detail just now. And it turns out that as long as you give zeros and poles to the gauge connection in just the right way, that sometimes that those theories can continue to make sense despite the, the poles and zeros. So in other words, they have still BV quantizable theories. And as a result, you get this incredibly large zoo of sigma models just from this 4D churn Simon spin. And they're integrable sigma models because the expectation value of the gauge field AW and AW bar, those are just the lax, those give you just the lax connection. So following this, there was some very nice work of Del Duc, Lacroix, Magro, Vicedo, um, who considered even more general configurations and they related this to the Godin models uh, that they've been studying. And, and I, I know that several people here are gonna be interested in lambda deformations and, I, and this paper uh, also shows how to find lambda deformed sigma models in this language. So what I want to do now um, is tell you how we should go from these integrable sigma models to an integrable superstring theory. And I'm gonna do this in three steps. First, I'm gonna show you how to get the metzayev zaitlin sigma model. Uh, then I'm gonna show you how to make a diffeomorphism invariant. In other words, how to get uh, the world sheet metric uh, to come out and the Virasora constraints to come out, to be included in these theories. And I'll also have to show you how to get kappa symmetry uh, uh, to work out because, as, as you all know, the Metzayev-Zaitlin sigma model on its own is, is sick. You really need kappa symmetry to, to make the theory uh, sensible. Okay, so on this slide, we're just going to do the sigma model. And this is a sort of prescription. So amongst the zoo of models, you can take the gauge group, which consists of PSU224, or probably everybody here's favorite like super algebra. And we're going to take four copies of it. And this four has to do with the Z4 automorphism that uh, this uh, Lee superalgebra has. And then we're going to pick our uh, form omega to have four second order poles and three plus three zeros. 
Okay, so that's just a prescription. And this theory is going to be consistent as long as we impose these conditions on the gauge fields. So AW has got zeros at the Qs, uh, sorry, has got poles at the Qs where omega has got zeros. AW bar has got poles at Q tilde and all three of them have got a simple zero uh, near Z equals PI where omega has got these double poles. So that turns out to define a consistent theory. There's a, the action is finite at all these points and you can define a propagator and so on. And for us, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to mod out by the Z4 symmetry. So the Z4 symmetry, remember we had four copies of PSU224. So the Z4 symmetry will do two things. It's going to take the first copy into the second copy, second into the third, and at the same time act with the Z4 automorphism. Okay, so that's just some action. And what's more, it's sort of gonna have a bit of a, like an orientifold flavor to it. It's going to act on one of the uh, coordinates in your theory, namely the spectral parameter. And I'm sure all of you uh, know about you know, the classical integrability of, of the superstring and you remember that Z4, the Z4 automorphism acts on the spectral parameter by this pi i over two rotation. So you mod out by this stuff. And well, if, if this was a, you know, a, a one hour talk, I'd be able to show you as a little calculation you can do um, where you, you can reduce this theory from 4D down to 2D while remembering that the gauge field has to satisfy these conditions. And you end up with some sigma model on PSU224 divided by SO14, SO5. So ADS, the supersymmetric ADS5, S5 comes. Okay. Now, in fact, when you're doing this, you have two options. You can send all, the Z4 symmetry tells you that you can either send all the Q parameters to zero and Q tildes, all of them, all three of them to infinity. And that's what Kevin and Masahiko did. And they arrived at the pure spinner sigma model. Uh, that uh, enters uh, the, the Berkowitz action. Uh, or you could send two Qs to zero and a Q twiddle to zero and the other ones to infinity. And that gives you the Matsayat Satan function. Okay, so these are just uh, kind of technical results that you can do. And I just want you to re now remember because it's going to be play a bit of a role throughout the rest of the talk that near Z equal to zero, AW has a second order pole and a w bar has a first order pole, and the other way around, near z equals infinity. I mean, in fact, if you remember your lax connections for Metzayev Saitlin, this is what you would expect. Okay, so that's the sigma model, right? Uh, the Metzayev Saitlin sigma model, but this is a not a very nice sigma model. The fermions don't all have kinetic terms, so we really need the full string theory, and I think. Uh, a few days ago, there was a discussion session, and, and, and I think everyone agreed that really you need to impose to get a string theory as opposed to just a sigma model. You need a uh, you need the Virasoro constraints, and in our case, we're also going to need kappa symmetry. So how do we how do we get diffeomorphism invariance in the game? How do we get a world sheet metric into the game? Well, we're going to uh, look at chern simons theory, and and if we just looked at chern simons theory or four D chern simons theory, that's naturally. Uh, diffeomorphism invariant. It's just simply, you know, the glib answer is look at the Lagrangian, there's no metric. Uh, it has to be diffeomorphism invariant. But if you have a boundary or if you have singular fields in the game, that doesn't necessarily continue to hold. In particular, here's, you know, just the action of a diffeomorphism on your gauge connection. And near z equal to zero, uh, you see a w bar has a first order pole but AW has a second order pole. So these guys get mixed up uh, and that's not compatible with these boundary conditions that we need to impose. So you know straight away from this uh, that diffeomorphism invariance is not going to hold near Z equal to zero and infinity, okay? How do we fix that? Well, we fix it by adding a new field and it's going to be uh, the Beltrami field. So we're gonna vary the complex structure. Um, and that will allow us uh, to then cure the diffeomorphism, to, to recover diffeomorphism invariance at z equal to zero and infinity. 
So concretely, what, what do we do? We take the Durham differential of this theory, which is just the BRSD operator, and we skew it a little bit with a lead derivative. And the lead derivative, remember, it has to go along a vector field. It goes along the dw vector field. And how much it goes along the dw is governed by precisely the Beltrami differential. OK, so we've changed our action. I, I don't write it out in components here. You can have a look at our paper. But you know, it's some new action with, with some new couplings between your gauge field and these betas. And so you might worry that your theory was not going to be uh, you know, topological slash holomorphic anymore. Maybe you've really messed up the properties in this theory. But actually, there's this uh, beautiful Cartan magic formula, um, which says that the Lie uh, uh, derivative is just the commutator of D with this interior product with a vector field. That's just something I guess you hope maybe remember from a differential geometry course. Um, but in any case, uh, you see, adding a term like this, so we're adding these terms to the action, you're adding something that's BRSD exact, because right? the commutator with D and D is the BRSD operator. So bottom line is, if you're just in the bulk, uh, if you add such a term to your action, you can get rid of it by a field redefinition. So no one ever adds such terms to chern simon theories because you know, it's a waste of time. Well, except that we will add it. And, and the reason we will do it is because normally when you do a field redefinition like this, so if you can take AW bar, redefine it with this Beltrami, you recover the normal 4D action, 4D churn Simons action. So that's why you would never bother adding such a term, right? You just do a field redefinition and you get back your original churn Simons action. But again, look, the same thing happens. When you have a first order pole near Z equal to zero in AW bar, but a second order pole in AW, and remember beta has to be regular, then you're not allowed to do this field redefinition. And so beta near z equal to zero and infinity is a bona fide field. So this gives us the definition of this beltrami chern simons theory, uh, BCS theory that we've called it, um, which is just the sum of the, these two terms. And you can check that that is diffeomorphism invariant everywhere, including these special points z zero and z equal to infinity. Now, if you work out what the equations of motion are uh, for the Beltramis, you get these expressions here just involving the gauge connection aw aw at z equal to zero and aw bar aw bar at z equals infinity and what's this uh, superscript the superscript is remember there's a z4 automorphism and it has four, so so each element the currents decompose into the zero one two and three uh, eigenvalues eigenspaces of that and and this is the just the, the two part, so the, the bosonic part. And that's precisely what the Virasoro condition looks like, this equation and this equation for the metzayev zeitlin superscript. Okay. So what about kappa symmetry? Well, this is going to be a little bit similar uh, in spirit. Namely, you know, when you have gauge invariance, it's a little bit like diffeomorphism invariance. You can check that the BCS action is gauge invariant. And near the boundary, just like in any gauge theory, if you with a boundary, you would set the gauge parameter chi to zero. If you do that, then uh, the theory is uh, gauge invariant. But we're going to relax this condition a little bit. And we're going to say we're going to allow the gauge parameter to, to have a simple pole in one over z at z equal to zero. Now, because the left hand side is z4 automorphism invariant, and because z, remember, gets multiplied by i uh, under the z4 action, you know straight away that the only, that, that the, the, the Laurent coefficient here has got to take values in the third eigenspace of the z4 action. And if you remember, that's one of the fermionic eigenspaces. So this is now starting to smell like kappa symmetry, right? We're doing uh, something that's going to be a local fermionic symmetry. But let's see how that goes in a bit more detail. Well, you see, we've allowed singular gauge transformations, so we expect our action not to be invariant, right? Normally, you, you need to set the, the gauge parameters to zero 
to have a gauge and variant action on the boundary, but we, we've relaxed that condition. So let's see, uh, whoops, let's see what the non-zero answer is. Okay, so this non-zero answer, it's just going to be something near z equal to zero because everywhere else it's regular and that's just part of the gauge symmetry of the theorem. So the expansion for a w bar, remember, was a first order pole. A w had a second order pole there and omega had a third order zero. So this is what the expansion looks like. And you can fix the fact that this belongs to the third z4 eigenspace and second z4 eigenspace, just simply like I said above, that these expressions have to be invariant under the z4 automorphism, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So that's why these particular guys appear here. Let's insert all of this into the four-dimensional action. Um, and the variation, the non-zero part of the variation only comes from the kinetic term, from A dA. So this is A, and this is the variation of A uh, w, the gauge variation, and here is the gauge variation of A w bar. And now you can just plug in uh, the, these uh, expansions near z equal to zero. Are you so when you've done, yep. Yeah. One minute. Sure. Um, so when you've done that, now rem you get four terms. And just very quickly, you see what happens is you have a, here, everything is traced in this action. And if you remember how the Z4 automorphism and trace work together, if you have something which is a product of the three, the three, and the three, that gives you zero. So these terms disappear. On the other hand, a three, a two, and a three, the trace does not disappear. And you're left with, well, what are you left with here? You're left with a z squared. And here you're left with a second derivative of a delta function. And here a z and a first derivative of a delta function. And that localizes, as expected, to just a contribution like this, near z equal to zero. And there's a corresponding one I haven't really derived for you like this, near z equals infinity. So, Singular gauge transformations near z equals zero and infinity mean that the action is not invariant near these points. But anyone who is familiar with this really beautiful review by Gleb and Sergey immediately will recognize, wait, I know what this is, and I know what this is. These guys are precisely the kappa variations of the matter fields in the Green-Schwarz uh, uh, action. So remember, when you're checking, when you're checking whether the Green-Schwarz action is uh, kappa invariant, you first vary the matter fields, in other words, the bosons and the fermions, and that gives you a non-zero answer. And you might think, oh dear, it's a non-zero answer. Well, actually, it's fine, because sometimes there are these special theorist identities that come in, the really old ones by Brink, Schwartz, Scherk, and Gliotzi, Scherk, and Olive, and they make sure that you can... Um, cancel this variation from the matter fields by varying the metric. Okay, so now I have to skip a little bit and just show you, for us, the metric are these Beltramis, and the Beltramis have to vary under the kappa symmetry. Notice they vary as a singlet of the gauge group, and everyone that has read Gleb and Sergei will recognize the matrix upsilon, which is, I think they call it the hypercharge. Uh, so it's just a constant PSU224 matrix, and you end up with the BCS theory being gauge invariant under these singular gauge transformations, fermionic gauge transformations, and so that, those other, that's the kappa symmetry. Okay, so this is my uh, last slide before um, concluding. So what we want to do is we want to quantize this theory. And in particular, you know, we know what the vacuum is, that's just the BMN uh, vacuum. And that has a very simple solution in the sigma model. Namely, you have, the left and the right, sorry, the W and the W bar currents are equal to essentially a constant times the, the generator of E minus J in the Lie algebra. And so you can lift this up and see what that looks like in the BMN, uh, sorry, in the, in the beltrami chern simons theory. So everything is of course proportional to the generator of E minus J. So I'm just writing this out for completeness. And here you see the, the Z bar component depends on time. Um, the world sheet time, because W plus W bar gives you the world sheet time. Um, and F, throughout you have this function F, which is just a simple function. I haven't bothered writing it down, but it's a simple function of Z and Z bar with just the right asymptotics so that these fields have got the right uh, boundary conditions that I described earlier. So now all you have to do 
is you just take your BRST operator, which involves the Beltramis, and you study it, you add to it this uh, BMN uh, vacuum solution. And that's going to be your BRST operator. And straight away, because you have this background gauge shield, you know that the PSU224 gauge symmetry is going to be broken to PSU2 slash 2 squared. And that's if you want the starting point uh, for the quantization. So I think I'm running out of time. Let me just conclude. Well, wh what I hope I've shown you very briefly uh, is that here's another formulation of the Green Schwartz, Matthias Saitlin superstring uh, in terms of the Beltrami and Simons theory. And integrability is completely manifest here. Now, these fields identities that I needed. They work precisely the same in the maximally supersymmetric plane wave and flat space backgrounds. And so everything that I've said today holds for those backgrounds too. And of course, it would be very nice to understand other backgrounds. And the kind of thing that's, uh, that's the kind of picture that's emerging is this is, this is the, the Riemann sphere, the Z Riemann sphere. These are the four points um, where uh, omega has got poles, and you've got this topological field theory living, uh, which encodes all the sigma model degrees of freedom in the WW bar directions. And the Beltramis, the related ghosts uh, uh, and anti ghosts, are living at the points z equals zero and z equals infinity. And this, they, they're coupled together through this topological field theory. So I think it'd be nice to understand this more fully and hopefully come up with maybe a derivation of holographic integrability, uh, an exact derivation from BCS theory. Okay, thanks. I better stop now. Okay, thanks, Logan. So uh, there, I have one question. Nobody has their hands up. So can you say what goes wrong if you don't work in 10 dimensions? For example, is this integrability supposed to be valid at the quantum level? So I think, um, the the integrability should be valid at the quantum level, but uh, and but the, I mean obviously as you know the Fierce identities also hold in six, four, and probably three dimensions, right? So I think at the level of the discussion today, um, you'll be able to write those down, but you will have you know just like just like you can have a, a Green Schwartz string in, in flat space in those dimensions as well. I'm a little confused about three, but certainly in four and six. So, but I'm asking about, not asking about world sheet conformal invariance. I'm asking about integrability. Uh, is the integrability supposed to be valid at the quantum level for any of these string theories? Or, I mean, if integrability is manifest, something else must go wrong. I'm just trying to ask what could go wrong. No, so I think we have, I mean, you would have to check that uh, uh, integrability survives the quantization, right? So sometimes there are anomalies. So, so here, actually, what's nice is, in principle, once you've, once you've worked out all the details of how you're going to do this, there will be some diagrams which are potentially anomalous. So I would expect that in these lower dimensional examples, you will find that some of those diagrams will be anomalous. I would be, I would be quite surprised, but I, but I guess I don't know. I'd be quite surprised if it was the, if the, four, you know, if the four-dimensional version of the green short string was genuinely a quantum integrable system, but I'm, but at least this gives you a chance to this gives you a you know a, a way of checking that so, because here if there is a if there if if the integrability is broken at the quantum level that's just that should be just manifest in some in some ordered identity you know at some low loop order. Okay, thank you, George. You have a question. Hi, Bogdan. Hi. I think uh, Kevin Costello spoke uh, at IGST in 2018, but in any case, this was a very, very nice and uh, accessible talk. Uh, so thanks. Uh, thanks. I think he spoke about something else, though. <laughs> uh, I think he spoke about uh, um, uh, topological.